Hi, I'm Scott, and this is Synth Stuff. Today's episode is going to be a little bit different. I'm not going to be talking about any of the synths that I have here today with me. I'm going to be talking about how I started and got into this, the history of how I got into music, and kind of a cautionary tale. Come on up next. <music> All right, if I look frustrated, it's because this is now the second time I've recorded this video because I realized about 15 minutes into recording it that I forgot to turn on my microphone. So here we go again. Hopefully it's better the second time. So how did I get into doing all this? Started out when I was a little kid. I had uh, eight years of uh, Royal Conservatory piano lessons, both practical and theory. And then of course gave that up because it was not cool. Um, big mistake. I wish I had continued with that. Uh, I, I, my keyboarding skills would probably be far better today if I had actually maintained that, that uh, dexterity. I was never really into popular music. I didn't listen to top 40 music. Uh, I would come home at, in the evening after I finished my homework. Here I am, a you know, 10, 11 year old kid. And I would get the headphones out of my parents' stereo and I'd plug it in and I'd turn it to, I think it was 96 point three if I remember correctly was the classical station and I would sit there and just let the classical music just wash over me and I've never lost that love of classical music especially big symphonic I mean Rachmaninoff and Tchaikovsky and just beautiful music that I would just lose myself in so not exactly typical for your average 10 or 11 or 12 year old kid however Growing up in Southern Ontario, in Canada, we had a radio station called CFNY. Now CFNY was a station that was kind of like K-Rock in Los Angeles, that they played alternative and new wave and electronic music that no other stations would touch. Up and coming artists, I think of like Simple Minds and Duran Duran and Blondie and Gary Newman, they would get played on CFNY first, months before they got played anywhere else. And it was unique and alternative because nobody else was playing it. And then eventually the mainstream would catch on to these bands and they would get start playing in the top 40 and CFNY would kind of step back from it for the most part. Also, CFNY brought across tons and tons of British music from uh, Heaven 17, Human League to Depeche Mode. I mean, all these bands, Susie and the Banshees, Simple Minds, nobody was playing these bands except for CFNY. So if you wanted to hear this this fantastic British music, and there was so much of it, your only option was CFNY. Of course, that meant because there was this radio station playing this music in the Toronto area, that there was a huge following for this music. And one night, dialing around on my clock radio in my bedroom as probably 13, 14 year old, I happened across this station it was playing this weird electronic music and my god that i love synthesizers and electronic sounds it just sounds you've never heard before and i heard this music and i was like what is this and at that point i was lost i never listened to another radio station again i became a cfny devotee i learned as much as i could about all the music they played uh that's all i listened to so now i'm 16 17 years old and I really love this electronic music. I've had a couple jobs. I've, I've saved some money up. I bought my first couple of synthesizers. I bought a Korg Poly 6, which at the time was going down in value because everybody wanted digital synths. Nobody wanted an old analog poly synth. They wanted a DX7 and they wanted a, a D50, I think was probably coming out soon after that. So it was relatively cheap. And of course, all the music at the time, all you heard was sampling everywhere. It started with the Fairlight and then it just everything, you know, big audio dynamite, just samples dropped everywhere. So I wanted a sampler. So I bought myself an Ensonic Mirage. Now I couldn't afford mixing. And of course there was no such thing as a DAW. Uh, I used cassette tapes and would just bounce things back and forth and, and overdub. And that's basically how I created music at the time. Now our high school had monthly dances and they would hire this old guy who came in and played top 40 music from five years ago and it was awful and nobody went. So my friend and I decided we're gonna create a DJ company and we're gonna go in and we are going to be the ones that play the music at our school dances and get all the girls, of course. So we started building this DJ business. 
Uh, we had lots of records between the two of us, um, lots and lots of CDs. I had bought my first CD player back in 1984, I believe. It was a Kenwood DP-1000, cost me $750. I still have it, it still works. Uh, so we had the CD player, we bought some Techniques turntables, not 1200s at the time, couldn't afford those, but we got some SLBD2 turntables, uh, modified them so that we could have remote start and stop, so we could cue them up and have it stopped and hit a button, it would start back up. So I built and programmed a lighting computer, we couldn't afford to buy one, so I took a VIC-20 and built an interface to it that ran a bunch of relays and, and ran our lighting system. Uh, we built our speakers bought an amplifier because you can't get around you can't really build a huge pa amplifier so we built this system uh scrounged around and created this dj company and the school refused to hire us however we knew there was a market for this music so we decided we will find some place that will hire us and we'll play music for the people and nobody would hire us so what we did is we went to a local church they had a hall and they would, once in a while, people go in there and they hold a dance and so on. And it was, you know, these old people that ran this church. And we went and made a deal with them. We said, we will rent your hall one night a month, every month, guaranteed, with the understanding that you do not rent your hall to any other groups coming in here wanting to do dances for, for the teenagers. And they went for it. So we had a, a contract where we would go into this place and it, it could hold a good six, 700 people in this place. It was a fair, fair sized hall, had a big elevated stage at one end that we'd set up our system on. And every month we would go in there and we would do a dance. I started to learn to beat mix. I would listen to the beat mixing being done on the radio and the dance music shows. I started getting more and more into the dance music. I, I really started learning beat mixing, learning how to derive the structures of songs. I mean, I had some of that from music theory and that definitely helped. So I could actually decide how is this song gonna fit into this song, beat match, uh, and, and it, which is a real task to do on a belt-driven turntable, I have to tell you. We would spend hours at home just practicing this over and over and over again. And we started doing dances and I'm sure the first ones were pretty horrendous, but you know what? We were playing music that the kids wanted to hear and they came out in droves. So the first couple of dances, we drew everybody from the high school and words started getting out. So as we started doing this more and more and more, we started drawing in kids from surrounding cities. We started growing and growing and growing till a couple times we, were at, we had capacity crowds, which was incredible. So we're making good money doing this now and we're kids living at home. We have no expenses. So every cent we made, we sunk back into the business. We bought more equipment, we bought more records. So we were just amassing this system. Of course, I had my keyboards at home and little cassette tapes so I could make these little tracks, you know, buried in seven layers of cassette tape hiss, but I could make these tracks and I could actually play my own stuff at the dances and watch people on the dance floor dancing to my music, which was just so cool. I thought it was just amazing to see that happening. End of school year came and we decided we're gonna do a blowout dance, but you know what? We have grown to the point where if we do this huge blowout dance, we do not have the capacity for the people at this church hall. So we rented the hockey arena in town with a capacity of about 2,000 people. And we did what was called the schools out dance and we advertised it all over the place. We advertised all throughout the local cities. We, we had uh, print advertising, we, had, we, we went all in on this and it was massive. Of course, our, our sound system we built was nowhere near big enough for an arena show. So we actually had to rent and bring in a professional PA system, a concert PA system and lighting system. So here I am with you know, my turntables and everything and then the massive PA stacks and, and we did the schools out dance and it was a huge success. We did not make a dime. It was extremely expensive. We had to rent the PA, we had to rent the arena, we had to buy liability insurance, we had to uh, pay for police officers, we had to pay, I mean, it cost a fortune to put this thing on. We didn't lose money, we didn't make money, but boy, did we get a name from it. This went on for another year or so. My partner decided, you know what, I'm, I really wanna do 
bands. I want to do sound for bands. He was big into the lights and the sound and the technical stuff. And I was more into the music. I want, I want to play the music. I want to be, you know, the guy that's playing the music and getting the girls. And so we kind of parted ways. He took most of the PA equipment and, and lighting and so on. I took the turntables and audio and stuff and the records. So he went off and did that. I moved to Toronto and started working in clubs. I got on fairly early on with a talent agency called EMC for Entertainment Media Corporation, and they specialized uh, in club DJs. And they had clubs that were clients, everything from you know the local bar and grill to big dance clubs in downtown Toronto. And they started me out, of course, in the small clubs because that's what you do when you start somebody new. They very quickly realized that I could play pretty much any kind of music to any kind of crowd. I was really good at reading the crowd. Um, yes, there were many nights where I was in the local O'Toole's playing Freebird. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, I knew the music. I could read the crowd. I say, this is a this is a Leonard Skinner crowd. Okay, so not that I loved the music, but I would play the music and I, I could, I knew what they wanted. They realized that I had this ability and they very quickly made me a fill-in DJ. So whenever they had guys go on vacation, guys who were sick or whatever, they would just send me to the club. I, so I was quickly working six nights a week and four of those nights was in a different club every time. And then I had my weekend club that was my club. I started building up my, my repertoire. Of course, my beat mixing was definitely coming up. I got rid of my belt drive turntables. I got my 1200s. Within a year, I was working in some of the larger clubs in Toronto. I was working uh, PM Toronto. I was working Lizard Lounge. I even worked in Sparkles uh, at the top of the CN Tower. I did some time in the Spectrum. I, I had a Thursday night residency at Hollinger's. I was definitely coming up in the world in, in the, of dance club DJs in Toronto. And of course, along with all those clubs, you get some side benefits, girls and girls and uh, more girls. And of course, as a 19, 20, 21 year old kid, having girls around you and paying attention to you because you're the DJ and the life of the party is never a bad thing. And this video here is from PM Toronto. This was not my night. This is a Thursday night that I just dropped by with my video camera. Uh, my buddy Glenn Spate is the DJ here. Uh, this was a college night. Uh, but you can see, you know, this is basically the kind of place I was working. Uh, this place had a capacity of, I think, about 2,500. I do apologize. I can't put the music in this video that, that's actually being played in the club because obviously YouTube will strike this video for copyright. So you can see Glenn here doing some beat mixing. So this club was a pretty tame club. This was a lot more of a top 40 dance. So you were hearing, uh, you know, New Order, Rob Bass, DJ Easy Rock, uh, um, that sort of thing. On late nights, we'd start playing more eclectic dance music you might not hear other places, but it was a fairly mainstream place. Lizard Lounge, on the other hand, was dark goth, Susie and the Banshees, uh, Cure, uh, so I mean, very different places. Now, uh, let me talk about beat mixing for a moment. Beat mixing is when you have one record playing and you adjust the pitch of the second record so that the BPM matches and then you have a, a break in this record that fits with a break in that record and if it's four bars long here or eight bars and you have eight bars over here then you can you know sort of transition across and the idea is that people are dancing and they're dancing to one song and then before they realize it they're dancing to another song and you haven't broken that up so they don't have a chance to get up and leave the dance floor you want to keep people on that floor well you do want to keep them on the floor to a certain point uh, but if you, leave, you get them on there too long, they'll get tired and leave. And you do want to cycle different people in and out. It's a whole science to it. You see this people, these, this kind of group over here, they're, they're off the floor. You know they like that type of music. So you can start cycling through different types of music and get people moving and on. So it's all about the controlling the crowd. And it's something you just learn through experience. So beat mixing. You have one record playing. And while it's playing, you're, you're adjusting the speed on this one to match the first one that's already playing out over the PA system. And then you gradually move it across or cut across. There's any kind of techniques to actually move across from one to the other or back and forth or what have you. And timing is critical because even just the slightest bit out of time sounds terrible and you know the DJ is crap. 
So in a big club like this one, like PM Toronto, we have massive speakers down on the floor that we're playing, obviously, the record that's actually playing. And then you've got to mix off that and mix with your other record to match the one that's already playing. The problem is that we got these huge speakers down on the floor, but they're far enough away that you have a delay from there to here. And so you have your headphones over one ear listening to your cue mix, and you got the other ear out in the open air to hear the floor speakers. If you mix from that, your beat mix is going to be off because there's enough of a delay from the floor speakers to this ear that the, the delay is going to cause the, the beats to be off. So what we had to do is we had a floor monitor in the DJ booth, and the floor monitor had to be so loud that you could hear it over top of the floor speakers. And then you had your headphones, and you had to hear your headphones so loud that you could hear it over top of the floor monitor. So imagine doing that for seven hours a night with 130 decibels of sound blasting at you for seven hours, two nights a week, because that's what I was doing Friday and Saturday nights. And then, of course, I was doing it also for another five nights a week in other clubs. Maybe not with massive floor speakers and, and a booth monitor, but still in a very loud environment. So you know when you go to a loud concert and your ears ring the next day? My ears were doing that for two to three days after every PM Toronto gig that I did. I would come home, I couldn't hear anything. Everything was dull, my ears were just so loud. Sometimes I couldn't fall asleep because the ringing was so loud. I wake up the next morning, ears still ringing. It would ring all the next day. So if I worked a Saturday night, Sunday was my day off. I, all day Sunday, I'd wake up Monday morning, ears still ringing. This was a problem. I started noticing that I was having real difficulty in loud environments hearing people talk. I couldn't understand what they were saying. And I started noticing that the ringing in my ears was lasting for longer and longer. I don't, I'm not quite sure what point I noticed it. I think I was, it was, I was about 21 or so. And I noticed that the ringing in my ears never went away anymore. I mean, I, I first didn't really notice it because I was working every night, but I think it, there was a point where I was sick or for, maybe I went on vacation, but there was a point where I didn't work for about a week. And that week away, my ears never stopped ringing. And I thought, something's really wrong here. I can't hear people talk right. My ears are ringing all the time. I went to the doctor. The doctor said, yeah, you've probably got permanent hearing damage. I quit DJing that day. I, I quit. I thought, I can't live without my hearing. I can't live without music. I can't live without this in my life. So I quit. So here we are, 30 years later. My ears still ring 24 seven. They never stop. So you know, you go to a concert, your ears are still ringing the next day. That's what I have 24 seven. It never goes away. I have permanent hearing damage. You can see here my hearing damage. This is the most recent test that I had done. You can see where that little dip right there is. So let me talk about ears. Your ears have tiny little cilia, little hair in them. And this, this is very simplified, but the, the sound goes in and vibrates those hairs. And those hairs are attached to nerve endings that then send nerve impulses into your brain. Your brain interprets that as sound. The highest number of cilia and the most sensitive cilia are in the human vocal range because our ears have naturally evolved to be most sensitive to the voice frequencies that we would be hearing from other humans. When you get noise exposure hearing damage, that most sensitive area is what suffers, is that, that area, that frequency area where the human voice resides, and that's exactly what I have. And when those cilia break off, the nerve endings don't know what to do, and so they just trigger nonstop. And that's, your brain doesn't know what to do with these, these signals going on all the time, so that's what you interpret as the ringing, that's the tinnitus that you hear, is just the inappropriate nerve ending signals being sent to your brain. If I, I could describe what it sounds like, if you were to take a graphic equalizer and kind of like dip down the sliders in the vocal range, just like it looks on my chart there, that's, in, in, in the sound that, that would result, that's what my hearing is like. In fact, 
what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this portion of the video, I'm going to process it through a parametric equalizer that matches my hearing loss curve, and I'll overlay the sound of tinnitus at the frequency that I hear it. So what you're listening to right now is basically what I hear when people are talking to me. This is what the world sounds like to me. Music is muted, people are muted, that this is my world. Now, if you think about it, the dynamic range available to me is decreased. So instead of having the normal dynamic range of a, in the human voice area, because it's depressed, I only have half the amount of dynamic range. So it makes it much more difficult to pick out vocal sounds out of background noise. And that causes hearing loss to be extremely isolating. When you are in a restaurant and it's loud, you can't hear what people are saying. I can't tell you how many times I've gone with friends to a restaurant, it's a noisy restaurant, and they're all laughing and chatting and having a great time, and I am sitting there bored out of my mind because I cannot hear a word that anyone is saying. I might as well be there alone because I can't hear anybody. And because of that isolation factor, hearing loss often is associated with psychological issues. When you isolate people from other people, depression usually follows. So hearing loss is not just, oh, I can't hear you know, the music great. It, I mean, it has serious ramifications. So I now protect my hearing <laughs> vigorously. I mean, it's a little too late. The horse has already left the stables, but I mean, I've got custom molded earplugs that do amazing noise reduction. They, they're sized to fit my ear exactly. They block pretty much everything. I have these Eargasm earplugs. I'll put a link to these. These are fantastic. These are special earplugs that have a diaphragm inside and a port. So it does a reduction in sound, so it attenuates the sound. But unlike foam earplugs or these uh, plugs, it attenuates it evenly across the frequency spectrum. So you maintain the sound quality, but it's just quieter. So if I'm going to see a band live or a concert where there's loud sound pressure levels, I will wear these because it brings the sound level down to a level that's not damaging to my hearing, yet I can still hear the full frequency of sound in the music. Eargasm, they're great. And of course, I've got my in-ear monitors for live or recording that block out the outside sound, but then feed in the sound that I need to hear at the level that I prefer to hear it and then I don't have stage monitors blasting and blowing my ears out. And of course, the end result of all this sound exposure caused hearing damage, hearing aids. I have hearing aids that they boost the sound frequencies that you hear in the inverse of your hearing loss. So they attempt to make up for the frequencies you're missing by boosting those frequencies exactly in the amount that you're actually missing them. Uh, it makes it much easier to hear people. Sibilance, s, t, ch, those things I don't hear without hearing aids. So it makes it tough. I know when I'm talking with people, a lot of the time I'm five or 10 seconds behind them because they'll say something and I have like a running recording of what they're saying in my head. And I have to sit there and think and analyze what they said. Okay, what was, what was that word? I didn't quite get it. And then maybe it's the other words they said in context. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I got it. So I'm not really listening to people as they talk because I can't really hear what they're saying. And so I have to like try to guess a lot and try to figure out the words they're saying. Uh, a lot of that is because you miss the sibilance. And now that I can hear the sibilance, it makes it much easier to hear. It does boost a lot of background sound as well. The digital hearing aids are much better at that than the old ones. Um, so I can't say I will go into a restaurant and be able to hear everything, but it's so much better. Of course, I can't mix or produce music or do anything of the sort with hearing aids because it, it colors the sound too much and it, it, the ending mix is just unlistenable. So that's my story. Unless you want to end up like me, not able to hear properly, having to rely on hearing aids in order to communicate, protect your hearing. I mean, if I could go back to my 18 year old self and kick my ass and tell myself to protect my hearing, uh, I, I would without question. Um, was it worth it? It was so much fun. There were so many girls, um, but 
no, it's not. It's not worth it. If I could go back and change it, I definitely would. If I could have proper hearing back, uh, without a question, without a second, I wouldn't have to think about it. So for those of you who don't have any hearing damage and are into music, are playing music, especially in live music, protect your hearing. Don't end up like me. Well, that's it. I hope you like this somewhat different Synth Stuff episode. If you like what you saw here today, please go ahead, click like, subscribe, click the little bell. It really helps us out. If you have any questions, comments, anything of that sort, leave it in the comments below. I read everything. I answer everything. Thanks for watching.